turbocharged excitement. Redline energy. Racer's sharp acceleration. The driver's lightning shift. This is Indy Racing. The race is on. Brought to you by... Speed. Competition. Challenge. The Molson Indy was Toronto's introduction to the big leagues. We're trying to run the car as fast as possible. We're, I think, more competitive than just about any sport I've ever seen. The danger element is part of your job. What makes racing exciting is the competition, the wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing, doing what you can to try to get by another person. With its combination of winding road courses and super-fast oval circuits, Indy racing has earned a reputation as a sport that puts men and machines through tightrope testing. All-out speed and fine-tuned agility. That's the Indy experience. You have to do a lot of work to gain a small advantage. And, and what it appears to on the racetrack, it looks like the driver's just out there driving the car around. but. Uh, what they don't realize is how close to the ragged edge, that fine line that driver is in every corner. We get to really just drive the heck out of these cars and, and give it everything we've got. And we do that every time we sit in that car. And that's just all part of the, the magic of running the car right on the limit and, uh, and, defeating and defeating it and defeating it and defeating it and defeating it and defeating it. This dancing hurricane would roar through the grounds of the Canadian National Exhibition on a temporary road circuit just minutes away from the heart of Canada's largest city. It would set hearts racing in Toronto and across North America. When you talk Toronto, you're talking maximum. It's got the biggest and it's got the best. The CN Tower, the world's tallest freestanding structure one of the biggest underground shopping complexes in the world. A transit system unparalleled anywhere. A cultural and entertainment scene that'll knock your socks off. It's got the spirit, the sparkling nightlife, the neon electricity, the cosmopolitan mix. It's got baseball, football, hockey. Now, it's got indie racing. Maybe Toronto was an indie town before they took it to the streets. Back in 1969, entrepreneurs Don Hunt and the late John F. Bassett Jr. proposed a 2.3 mile course. But it was to be years before the dreamed of Lakeshore straightaway would first feel the heat of Indy rubber. For the Molson Indy Toronto, the time was right. My first visit here for this race was uh, November 20th, 1981. So uh, we spend an awful lot of time in the, in the preliminary planning to see what an event will be. And, and how feasible it is for a certain area. What we liked when we came here was the fact that it's a facility that's already utilized by the population of, uh, of Canada and, 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 the, and the surrounding areas of the states to come for recreation, which means people know where it is. It's in Toronto, which is a very good metropolitan area, a lot of people, and uh, we knew it was an environment here that we could take and build a racetrack in, within the confines of this uh, situation that would actually complement the facility itself. Two months before the Indy, the track is paved with 5,000 metric tons of asphalt, $1.3 million worth. Two months allows the surface time to cure for the brutal Indy onslaught. The track has got to be as smooth and level as possible. Month after furious month of preparation goes into getting the temporary circuit ready. It's a lot of work for three days of racing, and it's almost as intense. Extensive planning, research, and more planning. The logistics of setting up a road circuit in as short a time with as little disruption to the surrounding community as possible. Around the track, there's layer after layer of safety barricades. 
it takes three weeks to set up the 2,000 steel reinforced concrete barriers that form a solid wall around the circuit. At 7,000 pounds, these 12 foot long monoliths aren't the easiest things to move around, which is why they're installed to keep the cars on the track. Atop the cement barriers are 10,000 feet of 10 foot high chain link debris fence designed to protect spectators from the automotive shrapnel that can fly during an accident. 40 feet beyond this is the six foot high spectator control fence, 19,000 feet of it. Concrete barriers will stop a car, but in head on areas like the end of a straightaway, the driver needs something a little softer. That's where the impact barriers come in. 1,600 feet of used tires, banded together and stacked five high, a welcome cushion between 200 mile an hour bullets and stubborn concrete. To accommodate the 60,000 racing enthusiasts and just plain curious, there's grandstand seating for 27,000, a massive skeletal framework that goes up in less than a week, days before the race. Then there's special seats, Chalets, pit suites, trackside suites, and pit boxes for another 4,200. And for those who want to see the action where and when it happens, there's general admission with designated areas to roam around in. Finally, there's the sound barriers. Massive buffers made of 40-foot highway trailers faced with plywood walls. Enough wood and steel to keep the indie roar from disturbing the surrounding neighborhood on a Sunday afternoon. Kirk Russell wrote the book on Indy racing, literally. Among Kart's many functions is the formulation of the rules and regulations. Kart is, is a sanctioning body. Uh, Kart does the same thing for auto racing that uh, the NFL would do for football. Uh, we are the government, so to speak. We organize the competitors, the circus, if you want to say that, and bring the show to the different, uh, different places that we race and compete at uh, throughout the year. It was the lack of involvement in administration and rulemaking among owners that got CART started back in 1978. Together with Pat Patrick, racer-turned-owner Roger Penske banded together a renegade collection of owners and racing enthusiasts in an attempt to raise Indy's profile, to make it a more visible and marketable product. They'd end up changing the face of Indy racing beyond anyone's expectation. From the beginning, Cart was stumped by the establishment. The U.S. Auto Club Board of Directors vetoed proposal after proposal, and Cart decided to take things into its own hands, to conduct its own Indy Series. The first Cart-sanctioned race was held at Phoenix in 1979. Seven years later, the Maverick Series has prizes totaling more than $13 million and an annual attendance of one and a half million. from Phoenix, Arizona to Long Beach, Portland, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Miami, Indianapolis. There's been seven checkered flags already this year. Now it's green for the Molson Indy Toronto. Eighth in the 17 race kart series, this latest edition is testament to the organization's endurance and growth. Together with championship auto racing teams, Long and Schaefer Associates designed the Molson Indy Circuit. It's a road course, all winding curves and blistering straightaways, smooth, wide, and fast. Everything a road circuit should be. At its widest point, the track is 60 feet, 32 at its most narrow. 11 turns wind through the course, turn and turn after turn. From the green flag, the cars blast onto the first straightaway. Into turns one and two, hard braking and lightning shifting out into one of the fastest straights of any Indy Series road race. Brake hard and hurtle through the sharpest turn of the track at close to three Gs. A short chicane and a hard left. 
then right around the west end of the course. Gear down and a sharp right. Then you're building speed as you approach pit row. Then flash by the start finish line once again. And so it goes. 103 laps of the 1.8 mile circuit pushes you to the limit, inviting wheel to wheel passing and encouraging fast, fast corners. Speed on the Lakeshore straightaway would reach 175 miles per hour, a 99 mile an hour average for the course. Fast for an Indy Road circuit. I can only give you the first impression, and it's very positive. Uh, I think it's a tremendous layout for a temporary circuit. It's very smooth, and uh, it's quite wide, and I think uh, it's very inviting for passing. Uh, I like the course. It's exciting. It's very smooth. It's got a good variety. Uh, the corners are quite fast, which is rare for a street-type circuit, and uh, they've done a very nice job of putting it all together. It's smooth. I think it'll be a good race track. Fast one. Well thought out, very wide. For the most part, it's a very, very safe course. Uh, they've done an excellent job, and it's very hard to believe that this is the first year venue for the Molson Indy. It's a world-class circuit. And the Molten Indy would be a world-class race. Everything is new, so for the drivers to find out the limits uh, for each corner on that racetrack is, is the big problem, knowing where the limits are. Bringing it all to the world of racing fans and armchair drivers is a feat in itself. The kart series has been broadcast nationally since 1983. It looks like the city's really getting into the race. There seems to be a lot of support, a lot of media attention. And uh, it looks like the people are willing and uh, wanting uh, some kind of event like this, a racing event with Indy cars. The on-edge excitement, the high-speed competition, all the climactic tension makes Indy racing visually powerful, emotionally turbocharged. Add to that Toronto's first-time status, and you've got the makings of a major media event. For the drivers, it's a round of promotional appearances and press conferences sandwiched between preparations for the race. For the Toronto media, it's a chance to get a close-up look at indie racing. It's also a lot of hard work. Ed Marcel coordinated the CTV coverage of the Molson Indy. Our primary goal is to make sure that every piece of pavement is covered so that if something happens, we see the race, we see the entire race. We see passes, we see the driving skill. But we have to have enough equipment here so that we cover the entire course, otherwise there's no point in doing it. Everything that we do is geared towards that product, that, you know, the whole package being smooth and being entertaining. And that's, that's really what the goal is. And hopefully on, on race day, it all comes together for us. Three networks, 17 cameras, miles of cable, and a crew of close to 100 at the track. And millions tuning in, all for the story of an indie race. Exciting, passionate, full of suspense, full of danger and joy. A cast of thousands and a non-stop plot. Stay tuned for more of The Race is On. It's in the air. It's close. You can feel it. Smell it in the methanol and burning rubber. Hear it in the revving engines. Pit Row is starting to look like Pit Row as the teams move out. The pit crews test their equipment. The timers get set for the trial, checking and rechecking to ensure accuracy to the thousandth of a second. Because in Indy racing, a thousandth of a second can mean everything. In all the buzz of pre-trial frenzy, there's one official you can't fail to notice. A 340 horsepower referee, the official Indy pace car. Before a race, the PPG pace car team tests the circuit, evaluating on-track conditions. During the race, the pace car is one of the most important on-track officials. It keeps the racers in their starting lineup before the green flag. During restarts, and during cautions in case of accidents or other track problems. 
The pace cars are one-of-a-kind automotive fantasies made real. The latest mechanical and stylistic designs and a showcase for the American automakers. The Indy pace cars are also evidence of PPG Industries' involvement with Indy racing. They're the sole paint supplier for the series. And it was their million-dollar sponsorship back in 1981 that made the kart series the richest in motorsport history. And they show you the colors of the beautiful PPG paint. So this, this is to represent our company and our commitment to racing. Sponsors are the lifeblood of motor racing. Without them, the kart series could not have reached its current high-profile major league status. Series sponsors provide prize money and racing necessities like paint and tires. In return, they get valuable exposure and a chance to develop automotive products under the toughest conditions possible. The results in the racetrack are immediately translated into some effort in the factory providing the very best tires that the industry can produce. What Computer Vision looks for is really there's a technology transfer that a lot of the innovations that have happened in a race car, such as disc brakes, aerodynamics, uh, carbon fiber in the bodies, those technologies eventually get transferred uh, to the consumer market. It costs anywhere from 2.5 to $5 million to run the average Indy team. One Indy car is worth more than $400,000, and that's not including replacement parts. We've got two different sets of plugs. We've got a, we've got a spark plug like you use in your passenger car to warm it up with. Then we go to a special race plug where you pay a dollar and a half for a spark plug for your car. These are $35 a piece for a spark plug. Then there's the drivers, the crew, travel expenses, motor homes, uniforms, and at least one extra $70,000 engine. A key member of the Indy team is the mechanic. There's around eight to a car, including the chief. They're the unsung heroes, the first ones in the garage in the morning and the last to leave. If they leave at all, a mechanic knows his car intricately. Years of training and trackside experience go into making a master. If something's wrong, it has to be dealt with immediately and efficiently. When we're traveling at speeds of 200 miles an hour, basically before we go out, we have to nut and bolt everything, make sure everything's tight. It's up to the mechanic to make sure this fine-tuned machine stays that way. Dedication, intuition, and highly developed skill are the keys. Before the race, before the trials, and after the trials, the cars and the engines are dismantled piece by piece, examined, and carefully rebuilt with all the precise care these master mechanics put into their craft. A driver knows his car, intimately. The slightest change in alignment, the smallest loss of handling, the tiniest variation in response is enough to spark concern. It's more of a team situation. Um, you've got to have a well-knit unit that works well together, gets, gets along well, has good communication, and uh, sees eye to eye. The garage itself is amazing. Millions of dollars worth of automotive art under one vast roof, and enough mechanical genius to make it all click. There are four basic styles of indie type cars. The English-built March and Lola are the most common. They look a little different, but that's about it. Cart's rules and regulations make sure their specs are virtually the same. We're restricted very, very severely in, in all aspects of the car. They tell us how much the car's got to weigh. They tell you how big the wings are, how wide the tires are, how, how wide the wheels are. So what happens is, you have to do a lot of work to gain a small advantage. It all starts with the tub, the cockpit of an Indy racer, and the rest of the car is built around that. The tub alone is worth $160,000. There's not a lot of room, no more than is necessary for the driver's comfort. The padded leather steering wheel has to be removed to let the driver in and out. 
He's strapped up with six-way seat belts in a semi-reclining position in a seat custom made to the contours of his body. This is the command post. The driver's got enough to concentrate on during the race, so there's as few distractions as possible in the cockpit. A few essential gauges, tack, temperature, and a boost gauge measuring the manifold pressure of the turbocharged engine. There are five speeds and lightning shifting. I'd say we probably shift around here 25 times in the course of a lap, so every minute about 25 times. From the cockpit, the driver can talk to his pit crew and mechanics by a radio fitted to his helmet, keep updated on the race, and warn them of any problems he may have. He can even adjust the car's suspension to affect handling while racing the course. Here on the side of the car, we have the, fuel, the main fuel receptacle. Again, during the pit stops, there's a large hose from a storage tank in the pit area that is plugged into this receptacle to put the fuel into the car. There's a four inch hose running back to that tank. It's a dry brake system. In other words, there is, if we have no problems, there's absolutely no fuel spill during the pit stop, which can cause a hazardous condition with a fire. On top, here's the vent. This is, has a smaller hose that is plugged in at the same time the main fueler is to let the air out of the tank so it will accept the fuel. An air jack on top of the racer is connected to air cylinders positioned throughout the car. When a driver rolls into the pit, hoses quickly transfer air from nearby tanks, and the car is up off the ground in a matter of seconds. That means the pit crew can start changing tires and servicing the car as soon as it's off the course. It goes without saying that the brakes have to be top of the line, especially on a road circuit. Vented cast iron discs are on each wheel. Most of the 15-foot IndyCar bodies are honeycombed aluminum, about 300 pounds heavier than the newer carbon-reinforced plastic, but a lot safer. An IndyCar is a wind tunnel masterpiece. Any exposed parts streamline to the max. Wings at the front and back of the car can be adjusted to create downforce and better traction or to allow a higher top end speed. On the sides, we have what we call the side pods. There's one on each side. There's an air inlet here that passes air through this section of the car where there's, on this side, there's an oil cooler which cools the engine oil. On the other side, there's a radiator, water radiator, which cools the water and winglets on the side direct rushing air past the rear tires. Right there, you've got about $250,000 worth of gleaming race technology. Then, there's the engine. Through a mechanic's eyes, that's 750 horses, a turbocharged, fuel-injected, double-overhead camshaft 2.65-liter V8. That means speed. The 1,550-pound automotive bolt flashes by at more than 200 miles an hour on an oval circuit. Too fast? Maybe. What makes racing exciting is the competition, the wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing, doing what you can to try to get by another person. It's not the speed. Um, I've been a big advocate, even though I was the first person to ever run 200 miles an hour in Indianapolis, of trying to get us slowed down. We don't need to run 200 miles an hour to put on a good show. What people want to see is close racing, and that kind of competition is what makes it exciting for me. There's always the next step. A little bit further, a little bit sleeker. The search goes on. Currently, technology is centering around aerodynamics, and uh, you know potentially that will be the biggest change, and it'll probably be something just dramatic over the next 10 to 15 years. The ubiquitous computer has found a place in racing, and Computer Vision's link with Penske Racing and CART brings it all together. Computer analysis has become an integral part of automotive design. Check-in technologies such as Computer Vision have given automotive manufacturers and designers advances such as being able to make changes much more rapid than they can manually. It's the ability to look at a design in a three-dimensional mode instead of just flat on a board to two-dimensional. It's the ability to take that design and that concept, analyze it, and then go and manufacture those parts. It's the ability to simulate uh, what that part or that engine or car is going to do on a road before you even commit to actually manufacturing an entire automobile. Nowhere is design detail and technological accuracy more evident than in the manufacture of tires. Tires are the link between the driver and the track, 
and there's a thousand ready for the molten engine. What Goodyear does for racing is to provide the latest, safest, best tire for individual types of racing and provides logistical support for the racers so they have no problems or worries about tire supply or the proper tire for whichever track they're racing on. Each course calls for a different design, a different construction. Oval courses are fast with turns in one direction. Road courses demand varying speeds, braking, accelerating, turning both ways. And each course has its own special characteristics. For an oval with turns to the left, the tire's designed with a softer compound on the left for traction and a harder compound on the right for durability. The construction of a tire can affect competition. If the compound is too hard for a particular race, drivers will be hesitant about passing and some of the edge will be lost. There's an awesome detail to the manufacture of racing tires. It takes a, a, a chemist and a magician to talk about compounds. Compounds play just as important a part and probably more in some cases than the actual construction of the tire. Uh, compound changes, even very slight changes can affect performance of a tire measured in tenths of seconds. If you have an identical construction with a compound change might make a difference of two tenths of a second per lap, which may not seem significant, but in the race of over 200 laps, two tenths per lap is a lot of distance. A racer knows his tires, and there's an art to their use. Racing tires wear in a matter of hours. They have to be kept fresh for the race, but they have to be worked in. Usually what we'll do is we'll qualify with a set with as few laps as possible, set them aside and use those for the race. A crew of eight works 12-hour shifts throughout race week, making sure this high-tech racing rubber is ready for the green flag. The tires just keep rolling in. Each tire has to be mounted on the racer's 15-inch cast magnesium wheels. Each tire has to be inflated, balanced, inspected, and analyzed. Again, computers play a big part. Tires are turned at high speeds during balancing, and the computer decides the exact location and size of the weight to be used. Designs are so secret, each tire is given a serial number and must be signed out and returned by the team using it. Come race day, it will all be put to the test. Stay tuned for more of The Race is On. weather doesn't stop the work of the Indy crews. Preparation for the race continues. At the pit stop competition, it's furious speed all the way. The competition is a publicity event and a practice rolled into one. It gives the people of Toronto and the news media a chance to see an indie pit crew in action, up close. It's also a warm-up for race day, as the pit crews go through their paces and check out the competition. It's good-natured fun, and it's a close simulation of the real thing, right down to the computer chip accuracy of the timers. But when the legendary Mario Andretti is slowed down by a technical difficulty with the air hose, he gets a second chance. He knows, and his crew knows, come race day, there are few second chances. That's why the pit crew is a crack team of seasoned pros. Only five men are allowed over the pit wall. But that's all it takes to change four wheels, fuel the car, and cool off the driver all in about 13 seconds. A fast pit crew can mean the difference between winning and coming second. That means practice, and more practice, as the split-second choreography is fine-tuned. It's done over and over until it's as close to perfect as it can be.
It's so critical, owner Roger Penske can be seen supervising his own team's practice. Lost time in the pitch is tough to recover. Come the real thing, they're ready. Swiss watch timing and assembly line efficiency merge in a poetic precision all along pit row. It's all done smoothly, quickly, and carefully. 1.8 miles to the gallon. That's the maximum permitted fuel consumption of an Indy racer. At that rate, 40 gallons will last less than 40 laps. When fueling the car, first thing, you got to be aware of what's going on around you, who's coming into the pit. The most important thing is you got to watch a fueler to make sure that the fuel itself is not leaking out of the car because of the chance of fire that's with that. I vent the car. Once the tank gets full, the fuel comes out of the top of the tank into my hose. That can't leak. Any leaks at all, we're in trouble. The problem with this fuel is if there is a fire, you don't see it. it it's clear through the day. And a fire is the most dangerous thing that we've got going right now with these things that we have to really be careful of. All you see is heat waves. You can't buy methanol at your local gas station. It's not your ordinary fuel. It's high in octane. It works well with turbocharged engines. And it burns cleaner than gasoline. Methanol is one of the alcohol families where it is not a petroleum-based product, where gasoline is petroleum-based. It's made from byproducts of natural gas. It can be made from many different things. Methanol is highly volatile, and a fire can burst through the pit area in seconds. It's invisible flame, a shock of sudden heat and suffocating terror. Everyone allowed in the pit area during fueling is outfitted in fireproof uniforms, but they're well aware of the danger, and that's where it ends. In relation to other motorsports, Indy racing's fairly safe, but risk is a given at any Indy event. With 25 cars cruising at almost four times the highway speed limit around a track about as wide as your average four-lane expressway, the potential's there. To the fans, danger is part of the mystique of Indy racing. To drivers, it's just another part of the job. Race car drivers don't think in terms of risk. I haven't met one yet that thinks about going out and hurting himself or the prospect of hurting himself. Uh, there's no room for error. There's cement barriers on both sides of the circuit. A lot of places you can make small mistakes and get away with. Here, you can't. And so you're going to have to really sneak up on it and try to find out where the limits are without getting over those limits because uh, you get over the limit, you're going to bend or break something. You're just, you know, you're trying to run the car as fast as possible and that always varies depending on whether it's in the race or in qualifying and what the conditions are during the race. I mean, if you're a lap ahead, obviously you're not taking those chances. And that's just all part of the the magic of running the car right on the limit. Hitting the fence is serious business, and when it happens, there's no time to waste. Seconds after Mike Nish fails to make turn number one at the Molson Indy, the Horton Safety Team's quick attack unit is on the scene. The Horton Safety Team was uh, sort of the culmination of a, of a concept of track safety that is totally self-contained at each racetrack. When we arrive at a racetrack, we always interface with the local emergency medical services uh, in that area. Um, we, are, we are designated and dedicated to the drivers, the crew members, and the car organization. Carl Horton's team of crack paramedics, firemen, and doctors also include specialists in head injuries, multiple trauma, and ear, nose, and throat, working with the best equipment money can buy. A self-contained operating room outfitted with the most modern medical equipment means Horton can offer immediate on-track treatment. A major part of our injuries on the racetrack somehow involve orthopedic type injuries, the broken bones, the feet, the hands, the arms, and now we uh, uh, have orthopedic surgeons that uh, travel with us at every race. The Jaws of Life is a huge rescue device, something like a giant can opener. It's used to free Mike Nish from the smashed hulk of his March racer that race day. So we've grown from a concept of how can we cover the track as far as track safety and fire suppression to an entire uh, uh, regimen of people that are capable of providing all of the fire, the uh, safety, uh, track maintenance, and medical at each racetrack for all the drivers, the crew members, the entire card organization as a family.
The goal of every driver on the track is to catch that checkered flag. The universal symbol of auto racing signals the end of the race, and the winning car is the first to see it. But flags do more than that. They're one of the key links in the communication and safety network. Flags let the driver know what's up ahead, keep him in line, and warn him of danger. Nick Fornoro is the key flagman, posted at the start-finish line. He's been at it for 30 years, and he's honed his concentration to a fine point. Flagmen have to be constantly on their toes, in touch with everything that's happening on the track. When they start making pit stops, you may take the first five or six cars are all in the same, lead, in the same lap, but they all are making a pit stop. And when they make that, now we got to know who the leader is. So it takes maybe a lap or so, the scores get it straightened out, so now I know who the leader is. In a sport that's all about split-second timing, the chief timer is a cart official. Cart officials are responsible for everything, from the starting lineup to pit supervision, from registration to track safety. If a barrier's knocked aside, it has to be replaced quickly. If there's oil on the track, if a car is causing a hazard, it has to be dealt with immediately, and lightning communication is essential. Before the race, the cart team works non-stop to make sure it's all ready, because race day is what everyone's here for. The race is on will continue following these messages. Dawn in Toronto, an indie dawn. But as the first gray light falls on Toronto, it's hard to believe that in a few short hours, the shrouded silence will split wide open with the roar of engines and the roar of an excited crowd. The bleachers rise out of the mist like the skeleton of some October midway ride. The night's been as long as any other, but somehow different. The track is a lonely highway heading into the day. The mechanics have been working through the night, tuning and fine-tuning, checking and double-checking, tightening every bolt, every connection, and every seam. The officials and the crews arrive, smiling with nervous excitement in the morning mist. The equipment is taken out onto the track. Tires are loaded into the pits, and the timing stations are set up. Everyone's got a job to do. The pit crews go through their routines just one more time, and then another. It's race day. The drivers appear. Each deals with the night before the race in his own way. I think more than anything, I try to get a good night's sleep, which is, of course, paramount, but also to go over what I'm going to do, what's the... Uh, the good, my strong points in the race, how the car's handling. If I've got a problem, what I'm going to be able to do to combat that problem. And uh, more than anything, just play it over in, in my mind a few times and then relax and, and go to sleep. Indie racing can give a false impression of easy glamour, but it's still maybe just one part stardust to ten parts hard, hard work for everyone involved. For those family members traveling with the team, life in the fast lane is a series of anonymous hotel rooms and few home-cooked meals. For those who travel alone, the endless highways can be lonely roads to ride. But there's something that makes it all worthwhile. The IndyCar racing, though, is people. 
because it attracts people from every walk of life. It's a very cosmopolitan atmosphere because you've got some of these wonderful drivers from different circuits from different countries. But you all come together with this common feeling, and it's, I guess you get the fuel in your blood. You got, you got to want to, to be involved in this. These are the greatest people that I have ever had the opportunity to be with. People should come up and, and get a feel of this and hear the noise and, 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 and feel what we are feeling. It's race day, and the turnstiles click as the crowd flows in. Nothing's going to stop them now. They're raring to go, go, go. Before the race, there's time to check out the track, cameras and autograph books in hand. For most, it's the first time. A first chance to experience Indy up close. The heart racing feel of shotgun competition is heavy in the air as the drivers size up the day, consulting with their mechanics and pit crews. There's Kevin Kogan, driving the 711 March for Patrick Racing. A 30-year-old in his fifth season, He's been racing since he was 11. Dune buggies, go-karts, and now the big time. Veteran Tom Sneva, driving the Green Skull Bandit March. A former school teacher with two national championships under his belt. Danny Sullivan, former waiter, cab driver, and lumberjack. Now one of Indy's hottest drivers, winner of the 85 Indy 500, and taking third place in the 86 Kart Series Championship. Mario Andretti, now in his 23rd in the year. An Italian immigrant to the U.S. at 15, he built his first racer with his brother at 18 and hasn't looked back. The winner of four IndyCar championships and driver of the year three times over three decades. Al Unser Jr., little Al, following in his father's footsteps and close on his tail. In 1985, he finished one point behind his father, taking second in the national championship standings. Unser is one of the youngest Indy drivers, with 45 races and three wins already. Rick Mears, driving the unique Pennzoil Z7 Special for Penske Racing. A fighter, coming back from serious foot injuries in 1984 to place in the top three, three times in 85, and looking to better it today. Mike Nish, an accomplished racer and ventriloquist who'd leave the track on a stretcher this race day. Jeff Brabham in the Valvoline Lola, a native of Australia and son of the pioneer of rear-engined Indy racers. Emerson Fittipaldi, Brazilian native and road circuit advocate, now in his third Indy season. Michael Andretti, yet another second-generation racer in the Craco STP Lean Machine. He would take second position in the 1986 Indy World Championship Series. And Bobby Rahal, winner of the 86 Indy 500 two months earlier and hours away from another checkered flag on his triumphant road to becoming the 1986 Indy Car Series champion, winning the PPG Cup. The green flag is a racing heartbeat away. All the months of preparation and years of training are packed into a few tenth seconds. The track is cleared, and the drivers take their starting position. It's loud, breathless. The smell of burning rubber mingles with the lake breeze. The roaring blast of Cosworths drown the cry of seagulls over Lake Ontario. The race is on.
midway through the race, a stripped bolt sends one of Randy Lanier's tires bouncing down the course, and only the precise balance of the Indy chassis prevents the major accident. Lanier rolls into the pits with his axle clear of the track. Ray takes the lead from Fittipaldi. Then, with the checkered flag still a glint in his eye, he's penalized a lap and has to go double time to recover the distance. Not long after, Michael Andretti loses the lead in a passing bid that fails, sending him into the impact barriers and coming within an inch of causing a dangerous collision as the other drivers break to avoid him. With just laps to go, little Al Unser loses a promising position and part of his front wing in a brush with another car. He's able to keep at it though. The wing is a breakaway piece and the rest of his car escapes undamaged. Ray Hall pulls into the lead once again and Danny Sullivan and Mario Andretti's best efforts can't beat him. This guy's going like the wind. And it's over in a wave of black and white and the roar of 60,000 fans. The Molson Indy has burst onto the world of racing. And as the drivers move on to the next green flag, they take a piece of Toronto with them. But they'll be back. Because in Toronto, the race is on.